Looks like we got our form here, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, today's topic is diagnostic errors in medicine. And by way of background, um, a landmark study was published by the Institute of Medicine in 1999 entitled To Error is Human, and it focused on preventable errors in medicine. Uh, the findings were uh, gathered from two large studies of hospitalizations in the United States. And they, they determined that adverse events at, uh, from a cohort uh, in Utah and Colorado, and we're talking about hundreds of thousands of patients, um, what adverse events occurred at a frequency of 2.9% in, in that group and 3.7% in Utah. And of these, uh, patient deaths occurred in 6.6% of the Utah, Colorado group and 13.6% in the New York group. So this, this data was alarming. And when they extrapolated to the 13 point, sorry, 33.6 million hospitalizations that occurred in 1997, they concluded that between 44,000 and 98,000 people die every year as a result of medical error. Now, you've probably heard these data in the lay press, um, but this, this um, was really a wake up call. And the errors that they, uh, defined fell into uh, these four categories, diagnostic errors, which were errors in or delay in diagnosis, failure to employ indicated tests, use of outmoded tests or therapies, and failure to act on the result, results uh, of monitoring or testing. There's treatment errors. These are errors in the performance of an operation, procedure, or test, error in administering the treatment, error in the dose or method of using a drug, avoidable delay in treatment or in responding to an abnormal test, and inappropriate or care or care that was not indicated. There were preventive errors, failure to provide prophylactic treatment, inadequate monitoring of follow-up, or ina inadequate monitoring or follow-up of treatment, and then other things like failure to communicate, failure to pass off patients well amongst colleagues, equipment failure, and other system failures. Um, and uh, at the Annenberg Conference on Patient Safety, uh, leading up to the publishing of this study in 1998, the year prior, uh, Nancy Dickey, the past president of the AMA, said the only acceptable error rate is zero. And then at the same conference in 2001, Gordon Springer, CEO of Alina Health, said, let's be absolutely clear on this. The goal of patient safety, of the patient safety movement, must be to eliminate all errors. This is like climbing Mount Everest, but it must be our goal and it can be done. So that led to two questions in my mind. Number one, is it reasonable to have a zero tolerance policy towards medical error? And number two, could the statement, the goal of, patients, of the patient safety movement must be to eliminate all error, which is like climbing Mount Everest, possibly the worst analogy ever offered? So that really got me interested in this question of risk climbing Mount Everest. So uh, here's a article entitled Effects of Age and Gender on Success and Death of Mountaineers on Mount Everest. And what they found was the overall death rate, well, what they found basically was climbing Everest is very risky. And so it's by, by analogy applied to medicine. Um, overall, the death rate um, for by age is 5% uh, if you're over age 60 and about 1.5% for younger climbers, and there's no gender <coughs> difference. But you're more likely to die on the way down, apparently, than you are climbing. And so for the death rate among summiteers actually is a whopping 25% for <coughs> people greater than 60 years of age and only climbs modestly to 2.2% amongst younger climbers. And again, there's no gender difference. So that actually got me interested in the question of, of whether um, uh, of the effect of age on, on on death in, and, and um, complications during hospitalization. And here's a, a study uh, published out of Great Britain, and they're looking at uh, all of the hospitalizations and, and uh, negative outcomes in England and Wales over a full t decade. So you can imagine, again, we're talking about millions of people. And they found the following. Our study shows that older patients are more likely to experience a misadventure during 
surgical care and medical care and more likely to die as a result. Hmm, that seems pretty obvious. Um, one explanation for the frailty of older people, one explanation for this is the frailty of older people, which alongside the presence of co comorbidities is likely to affect their capacity to survive misadventures relative to younger patients. Again, kind of obvious. Um, a fragile health status is also likely to account for the elevated mortality observed in children less than one year of age. So this is a graph of mortality by age. And you see that it climbs markedly as we go older. The higher rate of misadventures in older adults is likely to be a consequence of greater exposure to health care. So, you know, risk factor is simply to be a part of the system with advancing age. Furthermore, our studies suggest that older age groups have experienced a greater increase in the number of procedures performed than younger age groups. Despite being more vulnerable to misadventures, the data might suggest that older individuals are also being exposed to more procedures than in previous years. It is also possible that older people undergo a greater number of complex, risky, and invasive treatments to which they are more prone to error. Delivering the obvious, but um, clearly showing that, that uh, age is a, a risk factor for uh, complications and, and for death as a result. So uh, we can conclude then that as population, general population ages, we can expect both a higher rate and a higher total number of misadventures or complications. And with respect to zero tolerance, uh, the aging uh, baby boomer co cohort is a major driver towards an increase in reported medical errors. But today, we're going to talk about this first category, diagnostic errors in medicine. And um, a couple comments. It's important to note that most misdiagnoses result from our failure to consider the correct diagnosis as a possibility and not from a lack of knowledge of the correct diagnosis. In fact, a full 96% of errors are really just have to do with interpretation of the data and not knowing what the uh, true diagnosis is. So, um, and also to point out um, that the diagnostic errors occur most frequently in primary care settings, such as family, internal, and emergency medicine, and, and are less likely to occur in, in specialty settings. So, um, back to the question of can we, you know, eliminate the risk uh, or incidence of, of uh, diagnostic errors. This is a review that con considers the feasibility of reducing or eliminating the three major diagnostic uh, three major categories of diagnostic error in medicine. The first category is, are no-fault errors, and these occur when the disease is silent or prese presents atypically and mimics something that is more common. So it's, it's relieving to, to, you know, to hear that there are categories, that they give us credit that, that sometimes we simply can't make the diagnosis at all, and these are no-fault errors. These errors will inevitably decline as medical science advances, as new syndromes are identified and diseases can be more can be detected more accurately or at earlier stages. And they, they emphasize that these errors can never be eradicated. Unfortunately, because new, as new, uh, because new diseases emerge, tests are never perfect. Patients are sometimes non-compliant. What they mean here is patients sometimes just don't give you the information that you seek, uh, don't describe their diseases well, well enough for you to make a diagnosis. And physicians will inevitably at times choose the most likely diagnosis over the correct one, illustrating the concept of necessary fallibility and the probabilistic nature of choosing a diagnosis. The second category are system errors, which play a role when the diagnosis is delayed or missed because of latent imperfections in the healthcare system. Again, these errors can be reduced by system improvements, but can never be eliminated because improvements lag behind or degrade over time. And each new fix, every time we try to fix something in the medical system, we, we, it creates the opportunity for novel errors. There are always trade-offs uh, between um, making decisions, uh, trying to improve things because resources are limited and they simply be, are shifted from one area to another area. So um, we'll never be able to completely resolve the, the issue of system errors. And finally, the main topic, cognitive errors, which reflect misdiagnoses from faulty data collection or interpretation, flawed reasoning or incomplete knowledge, and the limitations of human processing and inherent biases using, uh, and the inherent biases in using heuristics, which are just rules of thumb to, to help you make quick decisions, 
I'm guaranteed that these errors will persist. Opportunities, however, exist for improving the cognitive aspect of diagnosis by adopting system level changes such as obtaining second opinions, implementing decision, computerized decision support systems, enhanced access to specialists, and by training um, to improve cognition or our cognitive awareness. So diagnostic, in summary, diagnostic error can su be substantially reduced, but never completely eradicated. So how do we make decisions? That's really the, the topic of discussion here. And, and decision making is really the most important thing that we do in our lives. I mean, we decide you know, where we're gonna go to school, what we're gonna major in, um, our careers, who we're gonna marry, et cetera. So how, <coughs> the question of how we make decisions is actually a very important one. And through the history of Western thought from, from the Greek, philosoph Greek philosophers up until the recent present, um, there's been a great emphasis on making decisions through a very logical and reasoned process. And, and, and it's been generally discouraged to use intuitive thought processes because they're thought to be too impulsive and emotionally based and really based on more kind of primal and evolutionary forces. So there's been an emphasis on using logical reasoning with all the great philosophers. And, and it, it is generally accepted that we become better at logic through culture and education and, and uh, intellect. Um, so there's a various schools of thought on decision making, um, big, you know, lifetime areas of research, and, and they fall into two categories, the intuitive versus the analytical approach. The traditional thinking in medicine is that with training, logic in, in medicine, training in logic and mathematics, physicians will, should and will use the analytical approach. They should obtain a complete history, perform a thorough exam, consider the differential diagnosis, then order tests, and arrive at a diagnosis using principles of logic and application of conditional probability. But I, I became interested in this topic after hearing uh, Dr. Jerome Grootman on National Public Radio uh, speak on, on uh, how doctors really think in, in, in the heat of battle. And he's the, the chair of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He's also the chief of experimental medicine at Beth Israel, and he's also a, a staff writer for the New Yorker magazine. And he describes clinical decision making in these five categories, and I'll, I'll go through his, his thought quickly here. So intuition, the use of intuition, um, these are his comments. The more experience you have, the greater temptation to rely on intuition or gestalt when making medical decisions. But this is fraught with potential for error, and you really have to remind yourself to remain systematic. Um, <coughs> another approach is pattern recognition which is based in heuristic, these, these rules of thumb, and certain uh, cognitive biases that are really built into us. And this is the flesh and blood decision-making process. All cues to a patient's problem from history taking to examination, radiology labs, and ophthalmology, visual field, OCTs, all come together at once to form a pattern in our mind. And this pattern occurs within seconds, largely without conscious analysis, and does not occur by a linear step-by-step -step combining of the cues. Rather, the mind acts as a magnet and pulls in the cues from all directions and hence pattern recognition. Uh, clinical algorithms, he, he uh, says, uh, can be useful for run-of-the-mill diagnoses and treatment, but they quickly fall apart when the doctor really needs to think outside the box. And, and, and he starts his discussion by, um, he, you know, he's a the lab research primarily, but once a year he spends a month on the general medicine wards and he became very concerned sometime in the 90s that when he wrote this, this book because he noted that, that a lot of uh, medical students and, 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 and residents had been uh, trained uh, to use clinical algorithms and he felt that they weren't thinking well and um, that they, you know, they, they weren't able to think outside the box. So in such cases, he, he states, algorithms discourage physicians from thinking independently and creatively and instead of expanding a doctor's thinking can actually constrain it. So uh, his thoughts on evidence-based medicine that it's rapidly becoming the canon in many hospitals and medical schools and treatments outside the statistically proven are considered taboo until so, uh, sufficient body of knowledge can be generated from clinical trials and this rarely mirrors the reality at the bedside. And then finally, Bayesian analysis is a method of making uh, of decision-making that is favored by those who construct algorithms and strictly adhere to evidence-based practice. 
especially people who design medical records and design our clinical de uh, decision support system. It relies on mathematics to model diagnosis and treatment, and it most, most importantly, um, is rarely do we have high quality studies that are available from which decision and analysis can drive the probability. You have to have very well designed studies in order to apply the mathematics. So in reality, we live in a world of medical world of pattern recognition using uh, heuristics, and um, we definitely become more error prone as we believe that we can use intuition to make uh, decisions. And there's really a question now, given the background of complete information, whether we even become more error prone as we move to in the more analytical direction. In the past few decades, there's been a confluence of data from a variety of fields, including cognitive psychology, neurology, neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, genetic, genetics, and philosophy that all support the central role of intuitive, non-analytical decision making. And the recent data suggests that many decisions in everyday life are made quickly and reflexively using heuristics and useful biases. And this is due to built-in neural architecture that has evolved through Darwinian natural selection. And it's viewed as, uh, these are viewed as efficient uh, mental strategies to deal with an uncertain and ambiguous world. And on most occasions they work, but occasionally they fall apart. So we really need to be aware of the conditions under which our, our, our fast thinking, our intuitive thinking falls apart. So two Nobel Prizes have been awarded in this area. One to Herbert Simon in 1978. He, uh, and both were in economics. He got uh, the Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize for decision making uh, in organization. He developed the, the concepts of bounded rationality and status splicing. And he also won a Turing Award, which is amazing. He's the only person to do this. The Turing Award is, is really the Nobel Prize of computer science and for basic contributions to artificial intelligence and the psychology of human cognition. Daniel Kahneman in 2002 won the Nobel Prize for the psychology of judgment and decision making, and he discovered these cognitive biases uh, for human error as a result of using heuristics. In psychology, heuristics and biases are viewed as, an effic as efficient mental strategies with which to deal with an uncertain and, and ambiguous world and they work, as I mentioned previously, on most occasions, but they do occasionally fail, but they're not as biased considered to be intrinsically bad. A cognitive bias is the human tendency to make systematic decisions in certain circumstances based on cognitive factors rather than using the evidence. And an example of this is the availability bias. And, and what this is, is if we see um, you know, 13 patients in a row um, with um, you know, a, a flu virus, because there it's, it's traveling through the community, then the 14th patient that walks in with uh, that the constellation of signs and symptoms, it's the most available thought in their mind, so we may just diagnose them with that, and it may turn out to be something entirely different. But these cognitive biases are thought to be very valuable evolutionarily, because if you see you know a threat in the savanna or the jungle, you, you learn it and you respond very quickly to it, um, and uh, you don't stop to think, well, maybe could that, uh, you know, could that be like a canine? You, know, you, know, uh, you just respond. So um, a heuristic is, a, uh, heuristics are evidence-based techniques for problem solving, learning, and discovery. And we use heuristics when an exhaustive search is impractical, impractical and, and thus heuristics are used to speed up the process <coughs> of finding a satisfactory solution. <coughs> And an example of heuris using heuristics is what we discussed previously, the use of pattern recognition in medical diagnosis. Which I just, uh, as an aside, found this uh, little story about Daniel uh, Kahneman interesting. Uh, this is uh, where he describes why he uh, ended up going into psychology. He was originally from Israel, and in, in late 41 or early 42, his family was living in, in uh, Nazi-occupied Paris. And the, the Jews were required to wear the Star of David <coughs> and to obey a 6 p.m. curfew. And he had gone, he was a little boy, and he had gone to play with a Christian friend and stayed up too late. And he had to return home, so he turned his brown sweater inside out in order to walk the few blocks home. As he was walking home, as I was walking home, I saw a German soldier approaching. He was wearing the black uniform that it, I had been told to fear more than others, the one worn by specially recruited SS soldiers. As I became closer to him, 
trying to walk fast, I noticed that he was looking at me intently. Then he beckoned me over, picked me up, and hugged me. I was terrified that he would notice the scar inside my sweater. He was speaking to me with great emotion in German. When he put me down, he opened his wallet, showed me a picture of his boy, and gave me some money. I went home more certain than ever that my mother was right. People were endlessly complicated and interesting. And I just found that um, quite moving. And that is, uh, again, what moved him to, to go into uh, the field of psychology. So the experimental data demonstrate that in busy clinical settings, physicians primarily use pattern recognition and di diagnostic decision making because it's fast, efficient, and often correct. Conditions of stress, and, and, and it's most useful under conditions of stress, fatigue, and sleep deprivation because we lose in these conditions our, our ability to use analytical reasoning and, um, theref and, and, and we move towards the use of heuristics and biases in order to, to get through the day. It's the most efficient strategy also. It's also the most efficient strategy under conditions of clinical uncertainty when the data is incomplete or ambiguous. And this is a quote that I found quite interesting from David Eddy, who's professor of health policy at Duke. Uncertainty creeps into medical practice through every pore, whether a physician is defining disease, making a diagnosis, selecting the procedure, observing outcomes, assessing probabilities, or putting it all together, he is walking on a very slippery, on, he is walking on very slippery terrain. It is difficult for non-physicians, and indeed for many physicians, to appreciate how complex these tasks are, how poorly we understand them, and how e easy it is for honest people to come to different conclusions. So, under conditions of time constraint, when we're, uh, the data is just unclear, and when we're stressed and fatigued, um, we, we move away from logical thinking and towards intuitive uh, thinking processes and, and in particular using pattern recognition. And the role of context here is very important. Context is the milieu in which a case presents and the decision is made. For example, contrast these two pa case presentations. If a, co a complex diagnosis made in a busy inner city emergency room at 3 a.m. by an overworked, tired, and stressed out resident who is using pattern recognition and other heuristics to get through the night. And then the same case discussed in Grand Rounds, taking a more logical and reasoned approach using, again, logical decision-making patterns. You, it's, it's understandable that under these different circumstances, you could come to completely different conclusions. So is, con is, is the context misleading or adaptive? Well, the brain is hardwired to interpret information via the context in which it is presented. And so here we have the letter B, it's you know, surrounded, uh, that we can interpret versus the same shape now understood to be the number 13. So we can arrive at very different conclusions depending upon the context in which information is presented to us. And the brain uses context to interpret meaning, which can be adaptive and also misleading. Here we have actually two different vertical black lines that are of identical size, but they appear, you swear that this line is much larger than this line because the brain interprets that we're in some architectural space, and this may have, again, you know, an adaptive uh, advantage to us, but can also lead to wildly different conclusions based upon the context. So context influences intuitive decision-making, and has a significant potential for error, but has little effect on rational decision-making. So as, um, again, under conditions of stress, time constraint, and and fatigue, we move towards intuitive decision making, which is highly influenced by context and very prone to error. <coughs> and consider this um, example as well. This is an actual headline from the National Post uh, in 2008. Man fatally shoots wife in chest and gets away with it. And, and uh, this was you know, on day one, this, this was the headline and there was uh, understandable outrage because the, the the perpetrator had been released from prison. And the following day we learn that the accused was an elderly man diagnosed with terminal cancer who was, in the sole, who was the sole caregiver to his wife with end-stage Alzheimer's and he died two years later. And that really just changes everything about how we interpret the case. And um, <coughs> so again, context has great impact on how we make quick decisions when we're just uh, you know, interpreting events as they're presented to us. So there's an article entitled Context is Everything and uh, written by Pat Crosshair, who's a big thinker in the field. And 
D states that retrospective investigations such as root cause analysis, critical incident review, morbidity and mortality rounds, and legal investigations all suffer from the limitations that they cannot faithfully reconstruct the context in which decisions were made and from which actions followed. In the past few decades, there's been a confluence of data, again, the same concept, from a variety of different fields, and they've all come, everybody agrees that we, all people who study uh, decision making agree that on this model for dual process theory. And um, it basically states that there are two ways to do things, which is what I've been presenting to you. An intuitive system one and a rational system two. And um, the properties of the system we've, we've discussed, you know, fast heuristic level thinking versus deductive thinking. The awareness in system one or intuitive is very low when, um, versus high when we're in analytical, very aware when we're thinking analytically. Um, it's a reflexive, system one is reflexive, automatic, it's fast. Um, the effort is minimal, low energy, and uh, you know works at 3 a.m. It's low, low psychological cost, it's very vulnerable to biases, it has low reliability, makes a lot of errors, um, has low predictive power, but and it's hardwired, probably hardwired into the brain, low scientific rig uh, rigor, and is highly dependent upon context. So this is a, this is dual process theory. Basically, if we're presented with a, pra a patient, we we um, it moves into a kind of a pattern processing session of the brain, and uh, we, we interpret all the data very quickly. If we recognize the data, we move immediately into fast system one thinking. Uh, in contrast, um, if we don't recognize data, we, we, we move along, or we should move along the system two path, where we're again using intellectual ability or education training and skills like critical thinking to, to try to arrive at a logical conclusion. Um, over time, as we learn a particular area, we, um, it becomes repetitive and it, it, it moves into more of a system one process. Um, and at any time, we can use, we can, if, if we find ourselves questioning our system one thinking, um, we, can, we can rationally override. And that's, that's really a main concept in this field is that we should be aware of which system we're in when we're thinking about patients. And, and the concept is metacognition, that we, um, we, we can be aware that we're really using rules of thumb and heuristic and rapid the logical thinking patterns and, and override the system and move back and say, okay, wait a second, let me think logically, let me break this down and, and rationally override the processes. So um, dual process thinking is a really big uh, model now uh, in various fields and it decides how we think and how we decide. Um, but it is, as I've mentioned, very vulnerable to error. So. So how, how do we overcome the, this, this, these vulnerabilities to, um, to, to making errors when, when we're in this fast thinking uh, mode that we're typically in as we're working in, in busy clinics? And um, so back to Jerome Groupman in his book, How Doctors Think. The majority of errors in, in physician thinking occur uh, because of a cascade of cognitive errors. And this, again, as I mentioned, rarely due to technic technical mistakes or a lack of knowledge. 10 per 15 percent of clinical diagnoses are inaccurate. In one study of 100 diagnostic errors, only four resulted from inadequate medical knowledge, and the rest of these errors fell into cognitive traps. And the major risk factor is being rushed. So th these are some of the, there's really at least 50 different cognitive errors. I'm gonna go through about eight of them. But these are the most common in medicine. Anchoring is a shortcut in thinking where a person, where a person doesn't consider multiple possibilities um, for, for a diagnosis, but quickly and firmly latches on to the first one that comes to their mind. It's very common. Again, these are evolutionarily ad adaptive uh, ways of thinking, but um, they don't always work in, in the complex world, real modern world that we find ourselves in. So this is prematurely closing a differential diagnosis. And one of the strongest safeguards against cognitive errors, uh, such as anchoring, is to make a short differ uh, differential on every patient. If you can train yourself to do this, um, you're gonna avoid this major form of cognitive error. 
And, and, and one thing on your differential, you always ask yourself, you know, what's the worst thing that the disk could be? The availability error, error which I discussed briefly uh, earlier, uh, describes the tendency to, the, to judge the likelihood of an event by the ease with which relevant examples come to mind. So what's available in your mind strongly colors the think your thinking about a new case uh, that has some similarity to frame of reference. So he gives an example in the book where he was a, uh, um, an intern at, at Highland Hospital in Oakland, California, inner city hospital, and he had just seen a number of, 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 of victims of violent crime come in who um, you know, were beaten up badly, and then there was a uh, a young man who, who, who came in, maybe the eighth or ninth person that evening or so, victim of violent crime and, and unconscious, and, and he just assumed um, that, that, you know, again, it was, he was a, a victim. But um, it, it uh, you know, I'm actually, I'm sorry, I'm telling the story entirely wrong. He, he, a number of drunk, he, he had a whole series of people who had come in under the influence, and then this, this eighth or ninth person came in under the influence, and he just assumed, oh, another guy. Turned out he was a physics graduate student at Berkeley who had um, had been be, you know had been a victim of violent crime and had been completely misdiagnosed as, as being a drunk. So um, the availability error is is one in wh where we we um, the, m the most recent events are the ones that are, that that come to mind most easily and um, set our frame of reference and may cause you to ignore the major differences. Um, in, in that particular case and come to an incorrect diagnosis. So Groupman says that being quick and shooting from the hip are indications of anchoring and availability and that these are the two most frequent cognitive biases in the emergency department and often they're all a doctor needs to hit the mark to make a correct diagnosis but they can also veer widely off the mark. So you really need to remember that uh, you know, haste is what forces you down this pathway and to, to be aware what tech thinking mode you're in and try to, and try to use some techniques to overcome cognitive biases. So confirmation bias is attention to data that support the presumed diagnosis and minimize data that contradict it, driven by an expectation that the initial diagnosis is correct and involves selectively serving the data. So once you've arrived at a diagnosis, you just pick out pieces of the data that support your diagnosis and unconsciously ignore pieces of data that might refute your, your uh, or contradict your diagnosis. So to avoid the confirmation bias, you need to pay attention to data that does not fit. So always look for pieces of data that just don't quite fit what you think is going on and then chase them down and figure out why they don't fit rather, or, or what's going on, why they're appearing rather than simply dismissing them. Improper framing, uh, this is an interesting one. This, this occurs with patients that are being referred to you. So if, if, if uh, somebody says to me, I'm sending a patient with primary opening and glaucoma, I may fail, I may just accept that frame and uh, fail to recognize that this is indeed an angle closure patient or, or a pigment dispersion patient. patient. And, uh, and it often occurs with specialists, once an authoritative senior physician has fixed a label on a patient, they usually stay firmly attached. Um, and self-aware physicians should should know that accepting the frame can lead to serious errors. So when you when you receive a patient who's been who's been labeled, you know, start over and um, and and try not to fall victim to this this framing effect, which is uh, quite common. So representative error uh, thinking is guided by a prototype, and we fail to consider properties that contradict the prototype. So, for example, um, uh, you know, we if a healthy fit man appears with chest pain, that doesn't fit the prototype of, of coronary artery disease. So we, we might dismiss it or, or diagnose it as, as muscle pain or something else. Or perhaps a young person with tough discs, you know, this, th it must be physiologic tough pain. It can't possibly be glaucoma. They're too young. But you have to be prepared for the atypical. Um, and, 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 and most importantly, as I learned in practice, don't reassure every patient that just because they don't fit the prototype that they're okay, because it, it may not be the case. An affective error is a tendency to prefer what, what we hope will happen rather than less appealing alternatives, and this tends to occur with people that we like. This is why we don't take care of family members, because we selectively sur survey the data. We want, we want a positive outcome for this person, and um, so we like them. And um, so the example might be in a patient that I like, 
and this patient is, you know, might have some suspicious discs, but their visual field results are good. So I overvalue that information. I, I report the great news. I don't bother to get an OCT that might have showed me the negative, uh, you know, the, the, the early glaucoma, and I fail to follow up appropriately. So I, 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 um, I commit to be affective, cognitive error. And I think this last one here, uh, this is the attribution error is a tendency to overemphasize personally based explanation, personality based explanation for complaints or symptoms. So when a patient sits a negative stereotype, we say, ah, it's, you know, he's a complainer, the spleen is in his head, or she's an alcoholic, or she's just drunken. And, and we fail to, 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 to recognize that, yeah, these things may be true. We may feel this way about our, this particular patient, but they may tr have a true underlying diagnosis. So you have to learn to recognize negative feelings towards patients and then plant a red flag in your mind, you know, that says, I'm thinking, uh, I, have, I have personal feelings about this patient that may be coloring my ability to see what's really going on. Um, so in summary, um, the, the publication uh, to Errors Human uh, from 1999 cast a real dark shadow on the American medical system. Approximately uh, 50 to 100,000 deaths per year were attributed to medical mistakes and, and this is, uh, resulted in a major call to action to reduce medical error. Uh, the challenges, however, are daunting. Like climbing Everest, medicine is inherently risky and unpredictable. Diagnosis and treatment are often obscured by uncertainty. Uncertainty plays a huge role in medicine, something that we, we often are unwilling um, to acknowledge. We have an aging population that is increasingly uh, susceptible to bad outcomes, that is susceptible to bad outcomes, and, and as the cohort ages, we're going to see more and not less bad outcomes, and that's going to make dramatic changes in, 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 in the medical system. Um, and it's important to remember that, that when we look at mistakes, retrospective analysis miss entirely misses the context in which decisions were made. And, um, and, and retrospective analysis is done, you know, like grand rounds or, you know, it's done, done using syst logical system two thinking. And, and, and so um, we can't necessarily understand how mistakes occurred if we can't create an environment in which we understand the context in which the decisions were made. The expectation of perfection or, or zero tolerance for error simply um, is, is unreasonable. Error cannot be eliminated because there are no fault errors, there are system errors and cognitive errors, which, which I went through earlier, that simply are built into the system and there's, there's, no, there's no way around them. Um, to reduce the, the, the risk for cognitive error, we have to remember that being busy, stressed out, uh, is really the number one risk factor for error. We need to uh, recognize when we're when we're under these conditions is basically whenever we're in the clinic seeing patients and we have to really structure our thinking, make a conscious effort not to commit cognitive errors. We need to always create a differential diagnosis and consider you know, uh, whether we're just anchoring on the very first idea that comes to mind. We need to always ask ourselves what the worst thing uh, this presentation could possibly be. And uh, am I dismissing or ignoring information in the presentation because I'm just focusing on what I think the answer should be and, and slowing down and saying, wait a second, what's this? You know, why does this not fit? And, and, and chase that down. Um, reduce in order, to, uh, we also need to ask ourselves um, whether we've uncritically accepted an improper frame when the patient is referred to us. Basically start over with your workup whenever you, you see the patient. And, and you know, this is a hard one because it, it's really built in, in into our, our, our uh, brains and in terms of how we think. But but um, ask ourselves if we're if if we're simply you know um, in an, in an environment where we're being exposed to one type of case consistently, whether we're we're just jumping to conclusions when we make that diagnosis in the next patient, and, and is my thinking erroneously guided by proto. Uh, a prototype, am I, am I considering atypical presentations for common diseases or fitting everything into this, this common prototype? So uh, in, in, uh, in conclusion, then remember that you know, to err is human <laughs> and to uh, forgive is divine. So I thank you for your attention.
learning theorists would tell us that you learn from our mistakes. That's where you learn. And so you shouldn't, the first thing I would advise is don't blame yourself when, when you're making mistakes. That's really the best way to learn. And unfortunately, the medical culture, the, the societal culture surrounding medicine is that we're supposed to be the history. So I think that's where the tension lies. You know, we're, we're, we're um, there, there's a number of biological explanations as, as to why uh, learning occurs best by focusing on mistakes. And, 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 and there is a time to go into that more, I'm not an expert in that, but um, the prime example is, you know, great chess players, for example, will the, oh, the, w the way they become great is they look at their games and they, they go back and they focus on the mistakes. And, and ev eventually, by, by through mistakes, thought processes become intuitive. So it's, it's counter to what we're taught, you know, that we're never supposed to make mistakes and, and everything can be learned you know, in, in, some, in a linear fashion, stuff like that. But it, it turns out that it doesn't always work that way. You know, the corollary is, is you have to be, um, the Hemings could, could point out your mistakes also, and, and so you can be 
submit to something and then you're going where the money is going. And, and, and keeping in mind that loans are volatile. You're really going to learn more from that first one. Thanks again for all the, the, the uh, meaningful comments and after the discussion. We appreciate it.